Do you still have your old PlayStation 2? Did you pick one up at a garage sale or a flea market? If so, there's a good chance that it's dusty and dirty like the one in the video here. Stick around as we disassemble, clean, and test the best-selling video game console of all time. Before the start of this video, I did plug this PlayStation in. It did read discs. Didn't feel it necessary to show because we will once again test at the end of the video. So let's get this unit turned over and we'll take out the two, four, six, eight screws holding the cases together. As you can see, it is missing one of the rubber feet. I do have extras, so at the end of the video, we'll make sure that we get that replaced. The rest of these, you can use a small flathead screwdriver and gently pry them out. We can now go ahead and remove the eight Phillips head screws, noting the four long and four short and where in the console they're removed from. We'll also pop out the expansion port door as well. This console is already beat up and scratched, so I'm just going to use a razor and quickly cut the warranty label. Using caution not to tear the ribbon cable by the power and eject button, we can now remove the top half of this case. It's best to tilt it forward, then to the right, and pull up the ribbon cable sticky. The power and eject button assembly is not held in with any screws. It can simply be unclipped and removed from the case. Here I'm tearing the sticker holding this rear anchor in place, and then we will slide that out. The bracket that holds the memory card doors in place is held on with one Phillips head screw. Here's a close look at one of the memory card doors. The small spring is on a fragile tab, so I would recommend leaving this spring on and just cleaning around it. Now we can take out the two Phillips head screws holding the controller port assembly in place. Then lift out the assembly, undo the clip, and unplug the ribbon cable. Towards the rear of the system, next to the power rocker switch, there are two more Phillips head screws that can be undone. Spinning the system around, we can pull up and remove the power rocker switch, followed by this bezel and then the fan. Use caution here because the wires on the fan are small and could easily be damaged. Throughout this process, there are a few times that the unit will need to be flipped over. Again, use caution to not let the fan, the power rocker switch, or the power buttons hang from their cables as it could cause damage. Lifting straight up, we can remove the lower half of the PlayStation case. Here once again, we can see the large amounts of dust that are built up. But these consoles are over 20 years old, so it is to be expected. The power supply is held in place by these four Phillips head screws. The power supply board is plugged into pins below, so we'll need to lift straight off. Use caution anytime you're handling this because the capacitors can hold a charge, causing an electrical shock. We can now remove the tin cage for the expansion bay as well. This piece of plastic that serves as an isolation shield for the power supply can be lifted out of place.
carefully using needle nose pliers to lift up on the connector for the fan, we'll unplug and set aside. I like to use a black sharpie marker to indicate where screws are being removed from, making reassembly that much easier. We can always wipe this marker back off with rubbing alcohol when we're done. I'm going to unplug the power and eject button assembly here just to get it out of the way. When doing this it's important to pull on the blue tab as to not rip the ribbon cable. All that's left now holding the tin chassis in place are the three tabs on the disk drive and one more Phillips head screw. Four more ribbon cables to disconnect and the disk drive is free from the main board. We can now lift off this heat sink tin from the main board. Inspecting the board, it is a bit dusty but I don't see any corrosion or other damage so this should clean up nice. Here we are at the halfway point of the project with the PlayStation completely disassembled. To begin the cleanup process, we're going to use Windex and Q-tips to clean all of the dust off of this fan. And there we go, I think this fan is looking much better now. This controller port assembly is also packed with dust. We'll first clean with compressed air, and then once again, we'll use the Q-tips and Windex. All of the larger plastic case parts will be cleaned with soap and water. Everything else will continue cleaning with Windex and compressed air. On the bottom side of this tin shield you'll see is the thermal pad. This pad helps transmit heat between the chips and the heat sink. We'll make sure not to damage this and that the area is clean. This clock battery tested at 2.8 volts, so we will go ahead and replace it with a new CR2032 while we're in here.
To begin the disk drive service, I'll first use a soft bristle toothbrush to clean any of the areas with large accumulations of dust. Any of the remaining dust will be cleaned out using compressed air. There are four small Phillips head screws holding the top of the disk drive in place. The laser assembly itself is fragile and has sensitive components, so we'll try to avoid contact with the compressed air. Flipping the disk drive over, you can lower the laser carrier by moving this white lever. This will need to be done so the disk drawer itself can be removed without making contact with the laser. I'll have a separate video on my channel where we completely remove the disk drawer and replace the belt. We'll begin by cleaning any of the old grease found within the disk drive with Q-tips and rubbing alcohol. Next, we will clean any of the dust, dirt, debris, or pet hair found within the disk drive. Now, using white lithium grease, we can lube the slides, the motor screw, and anywhere else that we remove grease from in the previous step. I like to first apply, and then actuate the assemblies, and then clean excess off after that. I believe one of the most important steps in servicing this disk drive is to make sure we get grease on this rail. That will allow for smooth operation of the disk drawer. If you wanted to remove the drawer itself, you would take the small Phillips head screw off the end and then the rail would pull out. Again, we will manually cycle this disk drive a few times, then clean off any excess grease. You'll see this white tab that I'm pointing out needs to be aligned with the groove in the disc drawer in order for it to close properly. One of the final steps to servicing this disc drive will be to clean the laser itself with 99% IPA. Before reinstalling the heatsink tin, we'll go ahead and clean off the Emotion Engine CPU and graphic synthesizer chips. 
Once again, to do this, I'm using 99% IPA. Now we'll go ahead and set the main board on top of the disk drive and get the four ribbon cables reconnected. The tin shield can now be reinstalled as well as the nine Phillips head screws holding it in place. We'll follow that up by reinstalling the isolation shield. The unit is now ready to have the fan reinstalled, so we'll fish this cable under the tin shield and plug it back into the connector. It's now time to reconnect the ribbon cable for the power and eject buttons, as well as reinstall the cage for the expansion port. After plugging the rocker switch back into the power supply, it can be reinstalled on the unit and then we can put in the four Phillips head screws holding it in place. Here I drop on the lower case, flip the entire unit over and make sure that everything is sitting flush like it should be. After putting this Phillips head screw back in, we can then take the power rocker reinstall to the bezel and then the fan slides in and there are two alignment grooves that help it sit correctly. You'll also notice on top of the fan there are arrows showing the direction of airflow. After reconnecting the ribbon cable for the controller port assembly, we can install the two Phillips head screws holding it in place. We are also putting back the two Phillips head screws that sit on each side of the power rocker switch. We can now slide this anchor back in the case, reinstall both the memory card doors and the bracket that holds them in place. The power and eject button simply clips into place in the top half of the case. Once the top half is back in place, we can reinstall the eight case screws. The final step to reassembly will be to put the four rubber feet and four plastic covers back in place. And my favorite part of doing these videos is taking a look at the before and after pictures. The only thing left to do now is to test it out.
Alright, and as we wrap up another video here, I just want to say thank you, especially if you made it to this part of the video being over 20 minutes long. And as always, I look forward to interacting with you in the comment section below. Thank you.